I know a lot of you people out there uh, don't understand. But there is a need for the world to know about this because the church is hiding and the government's hiding. There is a lot of people that died in those places. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not allow any of them to live. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their trees, and burn them in the fire. For you are a people chosen by the Lord over all others on the face of the earth. is on our side, we can commit any crime. We're, we're absolved individually from that crime by believing that we have a higher sanction. And that's the danger of religion in that it allows people to do that. It allows them to kill without a shred of conscience. The church knows where our children are buried. Even in the sunlight, the Alberni Valley was draped in fog that first morning I arrived there in the spring of 1992. Jesus once said that when we welcome the stranger, we're actually welcoming him. But how could I have known that by opening my door to him and to so many others, I'd be closing the door to all that I knew? Nothing was clear to me at first. I felt like I was on the brink of something, like standing on a dock, waiting. What was clear was that I was heading for a job interview at St. Andrew's United Church in Port Alberni on Canada's west coast, where I hoped to become the minister. When I walked through the doors of that church, I knew there was a deeper purpose that had brought me there. And sure enough, I got the job. There were no Native people in my church when I got there. You know, there was like 20 people in the pews on a Sunday, and they were all white. They were like retired loggers and millwrights, and, and about a third of the population was Native, and there were no Indians in any of the white churches. There were no Indians working in the stores anywhere. You know, It was just a, a totally apartheid, to, and it still is. It's a very much an apartheid kind of community. And that's actually one of the things that got me interested, just a little anecdote. When I went up at the end of the first service, I went up to the chair of my board and I said, you know, Fred, it's kind of odd there aren't any Indians around, you know, like, where are they all? And he got really defensive and he said, well, they keep to themselves, we keep to ourselves, and everybody likes it that way. And so when I went out to the, I got called out to the local uh, Seychelles Reserve uh, to actually to conduct a, a wedding a few weeks later. I asked a man uh, who I was marrying, Danny Gus his name was, he was a retired native fisherman and he had gone to the Alberni school. And I asked him kind of innocently why there were no native people in church and he finally said to me, they killed my best friend in the residential school, he's buried on the hill out back. And the church people all know it. They don't want us in their church. So it's kind of like right away, bang, it was in my face 
this reality, these two worlds living side by side, not just native and white, but um, kind of an official world, the official history, and then the unofficial buried history. But Danny Gus wasn't the only Indian who told me of murders in my church's residential school. In my first year as minister at St. Andrews, I spend most of my time just visiting people and getting to know them. That was my job. And my first job was really to open up my church to as many people as possible, including the native population. In doing that, as more and more people came into the church, I gave them a platform. They began to talk about crimes they witnessed in the Alberni Residential School, which was run by the United Church for over 50 years. And they described children being killed. They described uh, pedophile rings where children were being passed around between the Indian agent and the priest and other people like that. Yeah, I had an open pulpit policy, so after my sermon, people could get up and comment on it or share any of their own thoughts on that. And in the, in the native... What did the whites do? Well, the whites would get up, you know, occasionally a logger would get up and defend the logging and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, people had the chance to say whatever they wanted. And native people in their tradition, when to, they have, like, speakers who are officially delegated to talk. And so... When, to give you an example, there was a man, Alfred Keetla, who got up and, and began praying in his own language in church, which was quite something. It was quite, quite beautiful when he did that. But then, as speaker, he began to talk about other things, and uh, other people who got up would then share stories of children being murdered in the Alberni Residential School. That was later confirmed um, by a woman called Harriet Nahani, who actually witnessed a murder of a little girl by the principal of the Alberni School in 1946. Well, this fellow who Harriet claims killed a little girl called Maisie Shaw. Uh, his name was Alfred Caldwell, and his daughter was right in the congregation. She was part of the old guard of my church. Did you believe it? Well, when people who don't know one another keep telling the same story over and over again, even if you're skeptical, you have to accept the fact that, you know, it's a commonly told story. And when people began to go further and tell me things that I found later being validated in, in documents, then you can't deny it. You know, as a minister, you, lean, you learn to uh, detect bull pretty quickly in people. And you can tell in somebody's eyes when, they, when they're suffering, and it's incredibly painful for them to tell a story. They're not making this stuff up. My name's Harry Wilson. My name's Kenny Quittell. My name is Virginia Baptiste. I'm from the Osuyas Indian Band in Oliver, B.C. My name is uh, Harry Lucas. I'm actually 64 years old. My name is Tzibayot, from the house of Tzibayot of Ajida. My name is Nankaiska. I come from the people of Haida Gwaii. My English name is Douglas Wilson. In academic circles, I'm known as Dr. Douglas Wilson. I went to Port Alberta Residential School, 1959 to 1970. I went to the residential school in Cranbrook, B.C. My first year was 1955. I went until 1963. I'm a survivor of the Edmonton Indian Residential School. I was there from 1957 to 1961. At age five, I was kidnapped by terrorists in a gunboat. The RCMP had this gunboat. It was an a RCMP boat with a gun mounted on it to gather children from villages. We were, we were segregated right from the day one. I remember in September we were all on a beach and we were all given numbers. When I first got to school in Cranbrook, we were all given a number. Uh, my number was 54. And my, my underwear, my socks, my uniform, my uh, towels, everything that I had had a number. It was 54 on there. And all the girls had their own numbers. And if you were caught with a, somebody else's number, you got whipped for that. We weren't allowed to have books, and we weren't allowed to read. If you were caught reading any kind of a book or a magazine, you, uh, you, were, you were punished. There was a severe punishment that way. The kids who told on us got preferential treatment, whereas the children who sang their songs and spoke their language 
were punished constantly for every, any little thing, for even, even for laughing. It was always hard for us to tell one another we love you. Because we were taught to love was wrong. They told us to love was wrong, that was the devil's work. But yet, these priests and nuns could hug and kiss. And we couldn't even hug our own brothers. We couldn't even hold them and tell them we loved them. It took me a lot of years before I was able to tell my boys I loved them. Three years it took me to realize it though, you know, of torture and pain, you know, being strapped at a young, you know, I, I lost my childhood when I first got there and never knew what it was like to have parents. Still hurts. Sorry about that. Sorry, you don't have to apologize. But I never knew my mother and still don't today. I couldn't remember any good times that were there uh -huh. because I was being um, punished for things I'd never done. Like what kind of punishment? Um, punishment by restraining me to the bed, by putting a restrainer on me and holding me down in the bed. Um, I had bed problems as wetting the bed and they would tie me in bed and put an electric underneath my sheet so that when I did wet, I would electrocute myself. Did they put you in a hospital? Yes, I did. Well, they uh, gave me some drugs or something like that. What kind, what happened I to you? I don't know what kind of drug it was. What happened to you when they gave you the drugs? Hey, oh, they uh, put me in there like a padded room. Padded room, like, I was all strapped down. That was after you reported the girl? Yeah. Finding the girl's body? Yeah. I'd seen them burn hands of kids when they're three years old and five with a little spike in their hand and like that, like a shock thing. Electric shock yeah. device? Why did they shock the kids? Because the kids wouldn't listen to the Catholic priest. He used it on my brother's penis. He electrocuted his penis there till my brother passed out. And he was laughing, brother. My brother said he was laughing while he was doing it. You'd like to see him in pain, I guess. And then the police force, I, I was involved in a few investigations regarding the victims of the residential school where one particular individual had went home in the summer and learned how to speak his own language. And his dad had taught him how to carve. <coughs> and he went back to school. He, uh, he, uh, he continued doing this, speaking his own language and carving. And the teacher caught him and took his knife away and broke his carving up. And, and he took a pencil and he drove it right through his hand. And you, you still see the scar where he drove the pencil right through his, his hand. Then there was other times where they put us in a tub and then they had a bucket of snakes, you know, them black and yellow snakes. And they'd throw that in the tub while we're having a bath. And the snakes are, they can't stand that hot water. They try and crawl all over our bodies, trying to get away from that hot water. And they'd all just curl up because they die immediately. And those are some of the horrifying things that they'd done to us to discipline us, to keep quiet. What had I got myself into? My whole world was being turned upside down. I had a young family to support. My children were still only infants. I couldn't put them at risk, which I would be if I let those stories be spoken from my pulpit. I didn't know what to believe or who to believe. I know I didn't want to believe these stories. Well, when you went home at night with your family, your wife and two daughters, did you talk about this? Did they talk? Was this supper material to talk about? No, I couldn't really share this around my kids or really my wife at the time. Um, you know, it, for one thing, it was told in confidence, and another thing was uh, it was a nightmare. I needed help. I turned to the people who I thought would understand and support me, my colleagues in the church. That was a mistake.
From top to bottom, the church denied that any children had been harmed in the residential schools. Not only that, but church officials even threatened me to keep quiet about what I had been told. I was told to just stick to what they called being a good minister and tend to my flock. But that's what I thought I was doing by opening the doors of my church, even to Indians. And that's ultimately what the church found intolerable, that I was bringing that truth, you know, into the pews on Sunday and, and letting those people who had been silenced for so long, long speak. And I'm still trying to do that in the work I do. Well, didn't any of the church ministers sit down and sit with you and say, these are the rules and regulations, you're not to mess with the natives and this is what happens? They weren't that blatant, but it was a subtle, they were subtle warnings I got. Uh, there was a fellow, uh, Bill Howie, who was head of the, the church, he was kind of like the regional rep for the United Church on Vancouver Island. And he came over to me after my first Presbytery meeting, which is where all the ministers get together a few times every year. And, and I made a comment at that meeting about how it was odd to me that there were no native people in our churches and that and we should begin to look into the reason why. And Bill Howie came over and he sat down next to me and he, with this big flashy smile, he said, you know, you have a very promising career in the United Church and a young family to support. And if I were you, I'd be careful about comments and, t and looking too much into, into the native people. So it's like- Did you get it? No, I mean, to, to me, that seemed very odd he would say that. And I didn't think, you know, I was filled with illusions and I thought, well, this is the Church of Christ. I mean, we're not going to stab each other in the back. I mean, I was very ignorant of our own history. There's an establishment within the United Church in Port Alberni that um, set out to destroy Kevin Annett, and they, they set out by contacting those members, which I call the cliques in, in Port Alberni, uh, bring them together and uh, discredit Kevin Annett at all costs. Because what they had to lose was the fear of, of, of course, financial retribution from the Aboriginal people, but also they didn't want to hear about uh, murders and they didn't want to hear about abuses that took place with the Aboriginal people because they felt that they'd have too much to lose. And let's face it, they would. Who would want to go to a church that, that abused Aboriginal kids, murdered Aboriginal kids? When these stories began to be told, you could see some of the older white people visibly wincing and getting very uptight. And I didn't know at the time what it was about. It, didn't, it wasn't until subsequently that I learned that there was literal skeletons in the closet of, of, the, of the United Church, and they certainly didn't want them to come out. Yeah, I remember uh, back in 1992 when Kevin first invited us, I got the impression from non-Aboriginal people that, uh, that attended the service that uh, this was all fine and dandy, but uh, this really made a lot of them feel uncomfortable, and I got that impression by talking to a lot of them. And um, in fact, one of the comments made by one of the churchgoers was that they couldn't understand why Kevin was reaching out to us, the Aboriginal people of the Alberni Valley. Um, I understood why Kevin was doing it because there had been an alienation for a number of years. And, uh, but I didn't know that the, the anti-Aboriginal congregation that existed there was so adamant that they didn't want anything to do with us. What kind of people didn't they like? Well, definitely not the poor. <laughs> you know, that one was obvious right off the... Well, there is a lot of racial yeah. discrimination. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of racial stuff. They didn't want natives in the church. And as Kevin developed uh, the food bank and developed um, a dialogue about the murders that took place in residential schools, I suddenly saw firsthand um, the attacks that started to come towards Kevin. It first started out as whispers, and I remember hearing from people in the Alberni Valley who, who used to go to the coffee shops that uh, Kevin Annett was opening up a can of worms he shouldn't be opening up, and how dare he? Which is why I was removed so quickly. I was just summarily fired from my my job without any cause, without any due process or anything. On January 23, 1995, after nearly three years as minister of St. Andrew's United Church, Kevin Annett was fired without cause or notice by two officials of the United Church, without the knowledge or consent of his congregation. Kevin was told by one of these officials, Art Anderson, that there were no charges against him and that he was not under discipline but that nevertheless he had to submit to what Anderson called, quote, pastoral retraining and psychiatric evaluation if he was to remain a United Church minister. Anderson provided no evidence to support these requirements. At the time of Kevin's firing, his church was filled to capacity on Sunday mornings, and Kevin had just received a vote of approval for his work and ministry by 90% of his congregation. I had no idea that it would blow up in my life to the extent that it did. I was a total innocent walking into a minefield. You know, I thought, okay, the worst that could come out of this is they'll reprimand me and remove me and send me to another church. That's the worst that can happen. That's what I figured. 
Was this your own conclusion, or did you derive that with your family? You just no. I just realized that, that that's how you deal with a minister who can't doesn't fit, as they say, with his congregation. Which I know is bull because I fit with most people there. But I knew in the power politics of the church, it's always a minority who hold the power. And these people who were the old guard, who were connected with the people who had run the residential school, who were scared shitless of Indians, you know, I who had the guilty conscience, those were the ones who had the ear of the higher-ups in the church. And I knew they were going to remove me. But I thought that they would simply, you know, um, do the whole re-education thing and say, well, you've got to go and retrain and... And then you could have another church. But I realized pretty quickly when all of this stuff started happening that they wanted me out. They didn't want me. It was kind of like, uh, you know, in the Matrix when they, uh, the plugs start flying out of Neo, right? Like the system looks at him and goes, whoa, he's not going to fit. Flush. And they flush me. Uh, Kevin was a thorn in the side of the establishment. And one of the meetings that I was made aware of um, it came up, well, if you want to really get rid of Kevin Anna, then what you do is you attack his wife and children. And how you attack the wife and children is you put a lot of pressure on them and say that the longer Kevin Annett continues with disclosing these murders and continuing working with the Aboriginal people, the harder it's going to be for you to feel socially acceptable in the community. And you know your husband shouldn't be doing this. And if your husband continues to do this, there's going to be ramifications for you and your daughters. I didn't think that they were going to eventually, like, basically destroy my life, get rid of my livelihood and help break up my family, which they did. They, well, where did your family, did you, was your, did you did you talk this over with your family? Well, that was church business, you didn't talk with her? Well, eventually, children? eventually when, uh, with my wife Anne, who, uh, my ex-wife now, uh, I began to share a lot of stuff with her and she was getting really scared about all this stuff. But what happened was after I was fired, they went to her and they actually offered to pay for her divorce and help her if she provided them with information. And in fact, Subsequently, they gave her documents, which tried to make me look like I was mentally unstable, which she used in divorce court, and she got custody of her two young daughters as a result. So the fact that the church would do that would, would actually help in, in the divorce to get my kids taken away from me. The fact that they would spend a quarter of a million dollars to throw me out of the church, that was all telling me and other people a lot of stuff. That was telling me that there's a much bigger agenda here. They're, they're scared, and they want me out and silence by any means necessary. So you don't just do that to somebody who has, you know, offended the congregation or who isn't a good minister. You don't go to that extent unless there's some other thing you're trying to hide. And that was clearly about these murdered kids and the stolen land. I witnessed the death of Maisie Shaw. You have as much right to call yourselves Christians as the members of the Inquisition. Where is your apology? Where did you bury the children? Look, this is where we found those, uh, we seen those little skulls. You found them in here? We found them in here. There was coal, like coal. See, uh, we weren't allowed to come here. Never at any point when I was pleading with them to stop what they were doing to my family and I, even on that level of just how it impacted me personally, there wasn't a shred of humanity in them. They were like You were looking machines. in their eyes, nothing there. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you know what? When that happened to me, I realized up until then, you know, like any of us, it, it's somewhat abstract. People tell you stories and you keep wondering, well, how could they do this? When I saw what they were able to do to me, one of their own, when they turned and shredded my life mercilessly and allowed my six and two-year-old daughter to go through hell, I thought, if they could do that to me, imagine what they could do to a native child who wasn't a Christian, who was dark-skinned, who wasn't part of them. Of course they could kill them. So I watched, and she was standing at the top of the stairs, and he kicked her. She went rolling downstairs. She ended up, she was, she was uh, laying like this, her eyes were open, but she wasn't moving. She wasn't crying. So I see that all the time. Her name was Maggie. She was two years older than me. And she was murdered in there by a nun. She pushed out the window, second story up, and she died. But nothing was done about it. We weren't allowed to see a lawyer or nothing. 
they just covered this up. Jenny wouldn't cry out, and then all of a sudden, this blood just spurred all over the place, and on her, it was on her back, and a small part of her back here. <laughs> it opened up. It opened up wide. And the blood came. There was two young men ran away. They got as far as Jasper, and they froze to death on the highway. And <clears throat> I know the exact spot that they died. It's just like all of us have that history. We know what happened to people. When I allowed a forum for that in my church, lots of stories were told, including. Um, a, a whole hidden history of how the church had been selling off native land to its corporate benefactors, including Macmillan Blodell, a big logging company at the time. And there were all these little backroom deals going on with stolen native land. And I called the church on that and they th showed me the door. The whole process of your firing was farcical. The church knew there were 1,400 lawsuits coming down the pipe over the residential schools. I'm convinced that your removal was orchestrated from Toronto from the church head office. I think it's obvious to me that the national office removed you because they knew of the upcoming RCMP investigation and of the land deal after Marion Best got your letter. They were in for a rough fight and didn't want dissent from a Port Alberni pulpit. The sale and speculation of a house at First Nation land on Flores Island, lot 363 on Canada's west coast, by the United Church of Canada, BC provincial government, Macmillan Blodell and two local businessmen was brought to light and challenged between 1992 and 1994. The two individuals primarily involved in making these disclosures, Hereditary Ahousat Chief Earl McKenna George and United Church Minister Reverend Kevin Annett, have now been expelled from the United Church over these same events. In October 1994, I had attended a presbytery gathering. That's where the ministers all get together to talk over church matters. And at that presbytery meeting, the whole issue of how land was taken from the house its people was basically covered up and denied by the church. So I took issue with that and I wrote this letter. Subsequently, I was fired from my pulpit. The letter is dated October 17, 1994, and it's addressed to the members of Comox and Nanaimo Presbytery. Dear members of Presbytery, I am writing this in the wake of the brief discussion at the Fall Presbytery gathering in Gold River concerning the issue of the house its land settlement. I am both deeply concerned about the response of Presbytery officials to this issue and the way in which this matter was dealt with at Presbytery. My perspective on this issue arises largely as a result of long and fruitful discussions with the Ahousets, including with several tribal elders. The issue seems to be one of violated trust on our part, rather than any legalistic or documentary problem, as Presbytery officials have suggested. In a nutshell, Native land was given to the Presbyterian and then the United Church solely for the education and spiritual upkeep of the Ahousets, in particular the young people. This land was subsequently sold by the Church to a private white individual. Simple justice and decency requires that our Church rectify our wrong by seeking the return of the said land to the Ahousets and by publicly admitting our mistake. This issue has been clouded over by our Presbytery. Some officials have claimed that the Ahousets have created roadblocks to meeting or cannot produce appropriate legal documentation to show ownership of the land by the Ahousets. Sadly, these are precisely the words and accusations that a colonial system has directed against indigenous peoples ever since we took away their land. The very fact that we are waiting for the Ahousets to prove their case to us or to meet with us on our terms reveals at best an insensitivity on the part of our church to God's call for justice towards those we have wronged. At worst, it indicates a perpetuation of the racist and oppressive relationship that has been our legacy regarding Indigenous peoples. 
It is not too late to reverse this legacy or the wrong we committed in regards to the houses land issue. Indeed, it is imperative that we do so soon if we are concerned at all about our credibility and integrity in the eyes of both the Indigenous peoples here and the wider public. If we do not clearly and publicly admit our wrong on this matter and seek actively to return the land in question to the Ahousets people, I'll find it difficult to associate myself with the United Church on this issue. I urge Presbytery officials to meet immediately with the Ahousets elders on their terms and come to a mutually agreed resolution to this matter that upholds our paper position of supporting Native land claims. Anything short of this will expose a dangerous gap between our words and our actions. Yours in Christ, Reverend Kevin McNamee Annett. So the fact that I was fired for pointing out that the church was selling off native land to its corporate buddy, the big logging company, Macmillan Bloedel, the fact that I wrote about that and was turfed so quickly out of the church is proof right there that, you know, the, 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 the Achilles heel here is the issue of the land. How was it gotten? When you look into the mechanics of how the land was taken, it's out and out murder, mass murder. That's, that's exactly what I feel, that there, there was genocide. Um, the control was taken over when our people started to die through the smallpox, and that was, uh, we believe, was deliberately spread in our community. Smallpox was one of the most communicable diseases in human history and was responsible for the deaths of untold millions of indigenous people around the world, even after a vaccine for this disease was discovered in England in the 18th century. In reality, smallpox was a chief weapon in the deliberate germ warfare waged by European powers against native peoples because of its brutal efficiency. Within 10 days of contracting the disease, the victim was dead. I'm a descendant of Samson Piel. Samson Piel was the original family that were here. And the um, Samson and his brothers and his sisters were the last what left when they came back after fishing and working wherever they got back all the family were dead from the smallpox epidemic and they were floating all around the beach here and somewhere up in the, by the creek over there and they um, they had to bury them all. There's been a study of a, a general called Geoffrey Amherst, and Amherst, Nova Scotia is named after him. He was a, a British general who conducted germ warfare against the Mi'kmaq uh, Indians in Nova Scotia. And in the 1740s, he kept a journal of this. And he was so brazen, he didn't hesitate to record what he was doing in the journal. Again, because they didn't figure they'd ever have to answer to anybody since they were the law. And in it, he describes how they would go into hospitals where their own people had been dying of smallpox and they took the blankets and he gave it to one of his uh, subordinates, a major, who then gave, took it out among the Mi'kmaq and the other uh, uh, Indians who were allied with the French, like the Huron and the Algonquin speaking Indians in the eastern part of Canada. They were targeted, in fact mostly Huron were exterminated by, by smallpox. So they were openly admitting that they were doing this and all up and down Vancouver Island you have you know stories of the same thing happening, although happening through the missionaries primarily, because they were the first ones into the area. Harriet describes in her village a little place called Clouse near Port Renfrew on the west side of Vancouver Island. She says in the 1860s there was 3,400 people there. By the 1890s there were 44. So it had gone from over 3,000 people down to 40 some odd people. 98.5 percent of the population gone. And that was mostly from smallpox. And their people say that uh, missionaries and British sailors had been dropping off these blankets to them that were uh, laced with smallpox and that's how so many people died. You don't get that many people dying, you know, kind of accidentally. Somebody caught a cold one day. I mean, that isn't the way those things happen. It was germ warfare. Tuberculosis was another weapon in the arsenal of germ warfare used against native people in Canada. A fiercely communicable disease spread quickly by air and contaminated food Tuberculosis was responsible for many of the deaths of children in Indian residential schools across Canada. According to government officials like Dr. Peter Bryce, residential school staff deliberately and regularly exposed healthy Indian children to tuberculosis by forcing them to sleep and play alongside children dying of the disease and then denying them aid or treatment. 
It was this murderous practice that was responsible for an annual death rate in the residential schools of nearly 50 percent. We're in the same room with people who had TB. Um, they didn't separate us. And we were forced to play with them. The nuns made us play with those kids. We didn't want to get sick either, but they, they were forcing us to play with those kids. And also, they made some of them sleep with the other kids too. The interesting thing was at the University of British Columbia, where I began to study for a, a doctoral degree, I began to find these records from a, a report by a guy called Dr. Peter Bryce who, he was head medical officer for Indian Affairs. And in 1907, he went on a tour of all the schools out here, like on the coast and in the prairies. And he found that, uh, he claims that over half the children were dying every year from tuberculosis. And specifically from a practice whereby healthy children were brought in and housed alongside children dying of tuberculosis. And then none of them were treated or helped in any way. They were left to die of this communicable disease. Why? because they wanted to kill off at least half the children and want to cull the numbers down. And Dr. Bryce, who, I mean, this is not some flaming radical, he's an establishment doctor who's re reporting back to his boss, the Duncan Campbell Scott, who is head of Indian Affairs. And he said in his report, uh, the quote is, I believe that conditions are being deliberately created to spread infectious diseases. So he was clear, children were being deliberately murdered by a practice of contaminating them with TB. That practice were, was referred to consistently. It's, it's now even talked about in some of the mainstream academic books about the residential schools. So it's gradually been accepted, although it was reported on the front page of the Ottawa Citizen as far back as 1907. This is from um, Schools Aid White Plague. This is a, a discussion of Dr. Bryce's report. It's from November 15th, 1907, about 100 years ago. They said the average death in the residential schools in the West was 69%. So over two-thirds of the kids die after one year in these schools. That's talked about in the mainstream press. And yet today, so many people are acting like, oh, we didn't know this. Well, I mean, it's been public knowledge for a century in Canada. There's about 50% of the kids that died of TB. And uh, one thing I can tell, too, is that the chief over there now, her mother had 12 siblings. She was the last one that lived out of that school. She's seen 12 of her brothers and sisters go in there, plus herself, but she came out. She said then the other ones never made it home. The Indian residential school system in Canada was an extension and evolution of an older system of genocide that began as early as 1540 in eastern Canada and during the 1840s on the Pacific coast. Its foundational purpose was the deliberate and systematic eradication of all indigenous populations that would not leave their lands and resources, abolish their own cultures and languages, and become Christians. That purpose has never wavered, but has assumed different forms and strategies over the centuries adapted to the times and regions in which it played out as European conquest moved westward across the continent. European Christianity and its colonial empires were the plague. Residential schools were a refinement of that contagion. By the time that residential schools were firmly established across Canada, around 1900, the plague itself had exterminated most Aboriginal people in a genocide whose details are still largely unrecorded and perhaps forgotten. Well, we can look at the evidence of genocide and not, we can look at it and yet our mind not register the fact that it's proof of what we're talking about. This book is used in the university curriculum about residential schools. It has been for almost 10 years. And here's a uh, a picture of children with active tuberculosis sores. Uh, you see the bandages around their head. And the, the inscription says they have active, like open tubercular sores, and they're sitting here alongside healthy children. That was the practice described by Dr. Peter Bryce when he said they were being deliberately exposed to diseases. They weren't being quarantined. When you have tuberculosis, you're quarantined. You don't sit with healthy children. This is proof, this is proof of intent to commit genocide, this picture right here. Yet it's in a mainstream text, people look at it, and still to this day they say, there's no proof that we're trying to kill native people. Well, the proof is right there in that picture, in that practice, which was happening in every residential school across Canada, and it was documented by their own people. How did the parents and the relatives allow this to happen, the natives? Well, they did they do anything? Mm -mm. They weren't allowed to. One of the documents I found is a thing called the Application for Admission Form, and it's a document that every Native parent had to sign or they'd go to jail. And what it did was it actually surrendered 
it surrendered guardianship rights to the principal of the residential school. So what this did is you had to s sign away the guardianship power of your own child to the clergyman who ran the residential school. And at that point, the principal of that school then became the legal guardian of the kids. So that explains why these things could happen, uh, how it could happen, because they were the legal guardian. They could do whatever they wanted to these kids. I remember when I released this to the press in 1997, we were holding a press conference and two officials of the United Church snuck into my briefcase and stole these documents. We got that on film, actually. But they, they were very worried that this stuff was coming out and because it proved you know, that they were culpable and liable. And as a result, the, uh, in 1998, the uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice Hogarth here in BC ruled that the United Church and the government were equally liable 50-50 for what happened in the residential schools. I was angry at my mother for years till I met her. And then she told me she was forced to. It was in the Indian Act. The cops came there and they were gonna take us or she'd go to jail, be fined, or all three. And that's in the Indian Act too, it is. It's in the Indian Act. The Indian Act of Canada is race-based legislation that legally separates indigenous people into a separate and inferior class of citizenship under the control of one man, the Federal Minister of Indian Affairs. The Indian Act allows Aboriginal people to be expelled from their homes on reserve lands, arbitrarily jailed, subjected to involuntary medical treatment, and denied the right to elect their own leaders. Under the Indian Act, Native people are legal wards of the Canadian state in perpetuity, having the same status as children or the mentally incompetent. This racist legislation has remained essentially unchanged since it was first enacted in 1876. Its philosophy and regulations were drafted under the guidance of the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches through the Bagot Commission created by the Vatican in 1845. The Government of Canada enacted the recommendations of this commission in 1857 when it passed the Gradual Civilization Act. This legislation forced Indigenous people to surrender their land and identity and denied them any future title to their land, which was now owned entirely by the Crown. That's what genocide is when you look at its definition. It's two steps. They, uh, the fellow who coined the term, Raphael Lemkin, uh, who helped draft the UN Convention on Genocide, he had a de simple definition of genocide. Phase one is you eliminate the original pattern of a particular targeted group. You wipe out their language, their culture, you take them off their land. And the second phase is imposing the pattern of the domineering group on them. And that's exactly what happened in Canada, like in any colonized area, but it happened primarily through the churches here. This is the grave of Harry Gallaud, and for me he's the epitome of the problem. You notice his grave has been desecrated. He was an Anglican missionary, he worked for the government as well as the Indian agent, and he also worked for the local timber company. He was like church, state and company all rolled into one, and he was the man who brought in the local residential schools. who who made sure that the children were all imprisoned in the school. He is single-handedly responsible for a lot of the misery around here in the native world. So I'm not surprised that somebody desecrated the grave. This cross is a symbol of all the suffering these people have gone through. Before you entered the ministry, you uh, did not buy in what the church was doing. What did you think the church was doing? Back then? Yes, before you entered the ministry. Well, I knew that it was mostly talk. I mean, even as a kid sitting there in the United Church, I knew that y you could just tell things. Kids, kids are very intuitive, right? And they, they knew that these people aren't living what they're claiming. I mean, they're not loving one another. Is anyone coming over to our, our house when we're, we're struggling? My dad doesn't have his job anymore. We had to move down to a hotel in, in the downtown part of Vancouver. Were any of the church people coming over and helping us? No, not even the minister. You know, we were the pariah family all of a sudden. So I knew it was bullshit, but it, that didn't take away from what I felt in here was a message of Jesus, which to me was revolutionary. It wasn't so just, where did it go wrong, Kevin? Well, you cut me off there. Wait. Sorry, sorry. sorry. It, it wasn't just that Jesus was a nice guy, right? You know, the benign, kind of loving man. It was, it was, yeah, like the hippie, right? It, that's never how I saw him. I saw him as a revolutionary. He got murdered 
because he was challenging the powers on behalf of the people who didn't have any voice, on behalf of, you know, the outcasts. I mean, the woman who was going to get stoned to death or the people who are on the outside all the time, you know, the guys who get shit on all the time, they finally had a champion. And he said, not only am I your champion, but God is too. God loves you more than the asshole is doing that to you. And that's a revolutionary thing to do. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was like, it was like to me a new world. And I saw the church perverting that message. I saw them taking the side of the wealthy and the powerful. And they do this all over the world. They crucify Christ again and again, just like they're crucifying the poor. And I said, that's got to stop. I mean, that lie has got to stop. Well, it's like the early Roman Empire. They realized, look, we're not defeating these people. The more people we burn in the Colosseum and, and throw into the lions, the more people are being converted. They have a moral power here that's growing in the world. Our soldiers are becoming Christians and are saying we don't want to fight anymore. You know, the whole empire was unraveling. So they were smart. They said, you can't destroy a movement like this. You can co-opt and pervert it. And that's exactly what they did. They opened the door. They said, come on in and sit down, guys. Take a seat in the empire. We'll turn you into something successful. You know, we'll give you power so you can convert people. We will give you the means to conquer in this world. You don't have to be persecuted anymore. And they accepted it. They turned their back on Christ. They shut the door on him. And they became the church. They became Christendom. And they got blood all over their hands as a result. But he's still outside the door there. And I was trying to open the door. When a lot of the stories began to hit the, the press about, you know, when the lawsuits began against the churches and the government of being brought by residential school survivors, at that point, they, the church did li decided to, quote, delist me, which was to actually throw me right out altogether. The person who had arranged the hearing, he was the executive secretary of the church mm -hmm. out here, Brian Thorpe, mm -hmm. and um, he had arranged the hearing, chosen the panel members. The hearing was in the room of the church of a friend of his, and in addition to that, he was one of the four testifying against Kevin. I mean, here we're judge and jury and the whole thing gets blurred. I thought, wait a minute, what's this going on here? This is natural justice, isn't it? And this was natural justice. But this whole business of them, they knew I was taking notes on all the things that proved there was nothing going on according to natural justice. They saw me writing it down each time. Did they know who you were at the time? Did no, they, they know, did. Did they, know, did they know your background, or they just think you were some busy bloody woman? Oh, they the just back? thought I was a little old lady with very little to do. But after the first week there, I realized this was Canadian history, United Church history, and Native history. And deserves to be told. And I made a point of trying to be there all, what was it, 36 days of the hearing that went over six months. You look at indigenous people and say, well, why would we despoil our river? Why would we grab more land than we need? Why would there be poor people in our midst and rich people? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, no, no society can survive living like that. And yet it's the virtue in our society to operate like that. So we're crazy. I mean, we have become completely insane. And it comes out of that, you know, that, that terrible alliance that happened when you had this notion that a religion called Christendom was superior to all others and had to conquer the world, combined with the vested interest of a, a merchant class that wanted to conquer the world for its own profit, armed with this religion. Krishnamurti, who was a Hindu writer, he said a beautiful thing, and that's why I think, I don't believe in religions, uh, I believe the spirit is shared by people all over, um, but he said, uh, God hides himself in the most broken ones among us, and God hides himself in the most broken parts of ourselves hidden in there, but present, like a little seed. And I'd say that our worst experiences are a way to reveal that and for us to find a new meaning and strength in our life. Because when you lose everything for the right reason, for a just cause, or for people who can't fight for themselves, when you stand with them and lose everything, you gain everything. You lose the false things in your life that we're so wedded to. The only thing the church did for me, did to me, was say I'm sorry, wrote a letter of apology. Thanks, writing on paper and saying verbally to me, saying I'm sorry, doesn't work. It, makes me more angrier to think they can give me a few dollars and, and uh, that'll make me forget. No, we're not all one happy family. There's this whole world, like every society for 5,000 years, has rests on the suffering and misery and exploitation of some group of people. 
And you're not going to find God up in a church somewhere. You're going to find God down there in the garbage heap with those people. That, to me, is a message of Christ. So why don't we you get know? that, Kevin? Because Christianity was hijacked by wealthy institutions and the rich, and it's been their servant for centuries, when it really belongs in the hands of the poor. Now on, all generations will God has brought down the mighty from the throne and has lifted up the poor. God sent away the wealthy and has filled the hungry with good things. It's like what you get in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor and woe to the rich. He says that. And it's kind of like this big reversal. Suddenly all the things that the powerful, the government, the corporations, the churches, they all think everything's on our side. We've got the world wrapped up. We can go carpet bomb Iraq whenever we want. You know, we can destroy anybody we want. Suddenly... It's all versed, and those things are their downfall. And the ones who they're bombing, suddenly you realize, like Martin Luther King learned and Gandhi learned, those are the ones with the power to change history, not the ones who think they're in charge. That's a revolutionary message, and that's what I tried to speak about from the pulpit in Port Alberni, and also to create. I tried to create it. I tried to put it into practice, and you saw what happened. I mean, it's not surprising what happened to me, and I'm taking strength from that now because I realize it's what happens when you try to live the message, you will get nailed, but that's their undoing. It's not my undoing. I'm not undone. They're undoing themselves. That's the victory. From now on, all generations will declare me blessed for the mighty one has done the most magnificent things to me. stood up and walked with the lowest of the low honoring them before all of us I am now diabetic I'm now on dialysis I am losing my sight my legs are giving out on me and now I've got to realize too that I ain't got much time I know that, but I want to give my love to my sons for what days I got left because they, they got to know that I do love them, even though I couldn't tell them for years, but I do. I care about them lots. I didn't want to share my, my, my past with them, but I finally told them. They cried with me. Fed the hungry with good things, put the wealthy on empty and sent them away. Hey, 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 hey. And then reawoke in human hearts compassion. 
for wrong Who've breathed this air before And for wrong Who suckle at this planet Now And for all To come forevermore For all To come forevermore